Welcome to part 2 of this week's online lecture. In part 2 we will discuss diatomic molecules as harmonic oscillators. So let's have a look then at treating a diatomic molecule as a harmonic oscillator. We've got two atoms that are connected by an elastic bond that can stretch according to Hooke's law. So we're going to treat it like a spring. You may well have done an experiment where you have a spring and you put weights on that spring. The spring of course stretches as you apply more and more weight. You would have come up with an expression to relate the stretching of the spring to the mass that you put at the bottom of the spring. You know the force that you are applying to the spring, it will be mg, the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. You would have found that the stretching is proportional to that force that you are applying to the spring. This behaviour is Hooke's law. So we have our simple harmonic oscillator. We have masses m1 and m2 that are a distance r apart. We are going to assume that the restoring force is proportional to the distance away from the equilibrium bond length r sub e. So the distance away from the equilibrium bond length is r minus r sub e. If the distance is longer than the equilibrium bond length then this will be positive but the restoring force, as you can see, is minus k times that, so it will be in the opposite direction to r. So if r minus re is positive, that is, you have a length that is longer than the equilibrium bond length, then there is a force trying to compress the bond. But if r is shorter than the equilibrium bond length, then r minus re is negative, and so the force will be positive and will try to stretch the bond back towards the equilibrium bond length. Notice that the force itself is proportional to the displacement away from equilibrium. The constant of proportionality is the force constant k. It is not too tricky to determine the time dependency of this system. This would involve solving a second order differential equation. We could then calculate the vibrational frequency and you would get this familiar expression that the equilibrium frequency nu sub e is equal to 1 over 2 pi times the square root of the force constant k over mu the reduced mass. The subscript e refers to equilibrium. If the subscript is a number, say 0, 1 or 2, it means that you are in the v equals 0, v equals 1 or v equals 2 level where v is the vibrational quantum number. Note that as the force constant gets bigger, which would mean that the restoring force is larger, this expression predicts that the frequency would be higher. It is also inversely proportional to the square root of the reduced mass. If the masses are heavier, one would imagine that for a given force constant the frequency would be lower. So the form of this expression makes sense. What is the potential energy for a simple harmonic oscillator? You may well remember that energy is equal to force times distance. But in this particular case we've got a slight complication. Our force depends on distance. So we need to integrate our force with respect to distance to get the total energy. So the potential energy is equal to minus the integral of the force with respect to the distance from equilibrium. We can just substitute in f is equal to minus k into r minus re and integrate with respect to r minus re. The integral is equal to a half k into r minus re squared. You are probably familiar with this expression. You may have seen that the potential energy of a harmonic oscillator is equal to a half kx squared where x is the displacement from equilibrium. That is, x is equal to r minus re, the distance away from the equilibrium position. So if we were to plot the potential energy for this system, we would be plotting a quadratic function. So when the displacement is negative, when you've got compression, then the potential energy will still be positive because it depends on the square of the displacement. As the displacement gets smaller, the potential energy gets smaller. When the displacement is zero, the potential energy is also zero. But then, as the displacement goes positive, the potential energy increases again. 
What I'm going to do in just a little while is try to explain why the harmonic oscillator is a good approximation. We can clearly understand that it is not a perfect model. We know that we cannot continue to compress our molecule because eventually the nuclei are going to hit each other. So the model is not quite right in describing the behaviour during compression. It is also not right during stretching. If we stretch our bond, we know that it will eventually break. This model doesn't allow the bond to break. It also does allow the nuclei to hit each other. In fact, it allows the nuclei to pass through each other. So there is something wrong with the model. It is not perfect. But is it a good approximation for perhaps a small displacement? And for describing the vibrations of a molecule, are the displacements of the vibration small enough for this model to work? What we're going to do now is expand the potential energy for a diatomic molecule in terms of what is known as a Taylor series. This is just describing the potential energy as a kind of polynomial. Remember, you can fit any function with a polynomial, and that is literally all the Taylor series is, fitting the potential energy with a polynomial around the equilibrium position. So this is a more familiar description of a potential energy as a function of the bond length. Notice that the potential energy is a minimum at the equilibrium position. If on top of this I plot the quadratic function associated with a harmonic oscillator, you can see that very close to the equilibrium bond length that it fits the potential energy quite well. So for small displacements it does seem to fit quite nicely. Mathematically we can see why this is the case. Let's have a look at the Taylor series for all the potential energy here. I'm going to expand the potential energy using the first four terms. This first term is the potential energy at RE. This energy is just a constant. Then we've got a term that depends on R minus RE multiplied by the gradient of the potential energy at R equals RE. Then we've got a term that depends on displacement squared multiplied by the curvature of the potential energy around RE. The final term depends on the displacement cubed times the third order differential of the potential energy around RE. So why would this equation here be approximated by a harmonic oscillator to a good approximation? Well, let's have a look at these terms. Well, this first term here is a constant. We can set it to zero because it is just a constant. It doesn't really make any difference to us. This is because in spectroscopy, the spectral lines are just the difference between two energies. So the constant will always cancel itself out. We can set it to anything we want to, and for this purpose, we set it to zero. What about the next term here? This is the one that is proportional to the displacement but notice it is multiplied by the gradient at r sub e, that is, at the equilibrium bond length. What is the gradient at the equilibrium bond length? Well, of course, it's zero. It has to be zero because it is at the bottom of the potential energy well. So that means this term disappears or is equal to zero. So the first term we set to zero, and the second term is equal to zero. The next one, however, is certainly non-zero, as the potential energy definitely has curvature at the bottom of the potential energy well. And indeed, of course, the displacement squared is not equal to zero. What about the next term? Well, it is probably not surprising that perhaps the third order differential is quite small around the bottom there, but it is non-zero. It depends now on the displacement cubed. However, if the displacement is small, the displacement cubed is going to be a lot smaller than the displacement squared. And similarly, displacement to the power of 4 will be a lot smaller than that associated with displacement cubed, and that is smaller than the displacement squared. So these additional terms, higher order terms, displacement cubed, 
displacement to the power 4, displacement to the power 5, etc., are going to become smaller and smaller so long as the displacement itself is small. Mathematically, one of the reasons why the harmonic oscillator works is because it looks like this term. It is proportional to a constant times the displacement squared. The curvature is the constant. So long as we are not at a large distance away from equilibrium, then it is going to work. So long as we stay close to the bottom of the potential energy well, our harmonic oscillator model works quite nicely. We can appreciate that by just plotting the functions on top of each other. We can also see why it is rigorously true in terms of the mathematics. So we set the first term to zero. The second term is zero by definition. So to first order, we get this expression. Our Taylor expansion it reduces to this. Notice, of course, that all the differentials are constants because we are evaluating them at RE, at the equilibrium bond length. If you look at this Taylor expansion, you can compare it to this. We've got a term that looks like a half kx squared. The next one is one sixth gamma x cubed. X, of course, is the displacement R minus RE. So, in fact, there are a couple of things we can say about this. As long as the displacement is small, we can ignore these higher order terms. The other thing is, in terms of the shape of the potential energy of the system, we understand what the force constant is. The force constant is literally the curvature of the potential energy at the bottom of the potential energy well. The more curved the potential energy is around the equilibrium position, the larger the force constant will be, so therefore the higher the frequency of the system will be. The shallower, the less curved the potential energy is, the lower the frequency. So if we had a way, for instance, of calculating the potential energy of any particular bond length, then we could determine what the curvature would be, and therefore calculate the force constant, and therefore calculate the vibrational frequency. And in essence, this is how we do it on the computer. We solve the electronic Schrodinger equation that gives us the electronic potential energy and the shape of that potential energy around the equilibrium position tells us what the frequency of the vibration is. However, we want to know what the vibrational energies of the system are. To do this, we follow exactly the same methodology as with the rotational system. We set up the Schrodinger equation for the system. In this case, the system is a vibrational system. As before, the Hamiltonian depends on the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Well, we've just worked out what the potential energy is. We've got the kinetic energy term here. This is identical to the one we had before, just written in reduced mass coordinates. So here we've got mu, the reduced mass, and xi, the displacement. So this is the kinetic energy associated with our oscillator. This term is the potential energy associated with our oscillator, just a half k times the displacement squared. So if I expand it, it will look something like this. If I solve this equation, I can determine what the wave functions look like, and I can determine what the vibrational energies are. This is exactly what we did for the rotational problem. We solved the rotational Schrodinger equation. We came up with our rotational energy levels. Now all we are doing is solving the Schrodinger equation for the vibrational problem. It has a slightly different Hamiltonian, so we get different solutions. And of course, the potential energy surface itself is what is constraining the molecule. As I stretch the bond, the potential energy is rising. The restoring force is a boundary condition. And so the potential energy surface provides the boundary conditions for this problem. And so it's from these boundary conditions that we get quantization. And the quantization looks like this. We have a new quantum number, V and we have the frequency nu zero. Note that the v looks slightly different from the nu. I apologize for the similarity. In the literature, we sometimes use omega for the frequency. 
context normally helps you distinguish between the two. So the energy of the V vibrational state is V plus a half into H nu zero. V, the vibrational quantum number, can have values of 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. It has to be an integer. For each quantum number, there is a corresponding wave function and energy level. If we converted our energy from joules into wave numbers, we just have to divide the energy by H C tilde. And if we divide our frequency by C tilde, of course, we have a frequency in terms of wave numbers. So we get our vibrational energy term which is denoted by the symbol G. Remember the rotational term had a symbol F. The vibrational term has a symbol G. And the vibrational term is equal to V plus a half times nu zero. Where nu zero is the fundamental frequency of vibration. So we have determined what the vibrational term is. So let's plot, as a function of energy, what the energies are for the different vibrational quantum numbers. Well, if V is equal to zero, G is equal to half nu zero. If V is equal to one, G is equal to three halves nu zero. If V is equal to two, G is equal to five halves nu zero. And if V is equal to three, G is equal to seven halves nu zero. Notice that the gap between the vibrational energy levels is the same. It is just equal to nu zero. So if I go from v equals zero to v equals one, the gap is nu zero. If I go from v equals one to v equals two, the gap is still nu zero. And the same all the way up. So we've got equally spaced vibrational energy levels. So the solution to the harmonic oscillator is a set of equally spaced vibrational energy levels. Something weird has happened though, something different from the rotational system. In the rotational system, the energy of the lowest rotational level was zero. There was no energy associated with it. It was literally at rest. This is not the case for the vibrational system. The vibrational system, when it is in its lowest vibrational state, has an energy of a half new zero. It is not at the very bottom of the potential energy well, it is slightly above it. This energy, half nu zero, is known as the zero point energy. When V is equal to zero, G is equal to a half nu zero. What this implies is that the molecule is never at rest, even if I reduce the temperature down to absolute zero. When the molecule is in its lowest vibrational state, it still has vibrational energy. It is still vibrating even at T is equal to zero Kelvin. The reason why that is happening is if it didn't have vibrational energy, we would have problems with the uncertainty principle. Another way of looking at this is similar to when we discussed the particle in the box model, which also had zero point energy. Because the potential energy surface is confining the molecule to a certain region of space, the wave function has to be curved. And if your wave function is curved, it's got to have energy. Because remember, the kinetic energy operator is a second order differential. It is telling you what is the curvature of the wave function. If you were restricting the molecule in a certain region of space, that wave function has got to be curved. So it has got to have different values, it has got to exist somewhere. So this is where the zero point energy arises. Because the molecule exists, it has to have vibrational energy in its lowest vibrational state. This is the end of part two of this week's online lecture. Please continue on to part three.